uh, a part of the cadet program prepared me for my life. Knowing young men like Mason Stalker made me a better person and made my life, my life worthwhile. I'd like to introduce you to Mason Stalker, Lieutenant Colonel, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, one of my heroes. Good afternoon, Commander Bates, Colonel Philip Sherwin, and most importantly, all 50 of the delegates here uh, this weekend representing the Cadet Corps of British Columbia. I'm, I'm Mason, and it's a great pleasure that I'm here this weekend to be part of Pillars 2012. I understand this is the eighth Pillars, and I think that this is a great, great, great event that is only going to produce much, much more success. But I, I kind of owe you a bit of an apology up front here. Um, as you see, I, I do have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, but, you know, I kind of took a look at this, did a bit of a mission analysis on what I should be delivering uh, this weekend. And I said, ooh, there are going to be infantry officers in the room. So I've got lots of pictures, and we should be good to go. And, uh, <laughs> but, but, but all kidding aside, it is absolutely wonderful to be back here in Vernon, um, and of course, British Columbia. Um, I'm actually destined to come back again this summer. Uh, I'm posted as Chief of Staff 39 Brigade, which I'm looking forward to coming back to uh, my roots, and it's good to be home. Um, a little disclaimer uh, before we carry on with the rest of uh, the, rest of the uh, presentation. Um, I, I'm also a pro I said I was an infantry officer and, and also a product of the Revelstoke Secondary School System. So, knowing this, I've asked, uh, I've asked uh, Captain Townley to move the slides for me just to keep things very simple uh, and basic. Uh, so, Tim, I appreciate uh, your help with that in advance. So, 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 why am I here and why am I talking to you at Pillars 2012? Well, there's actually a bit of a story that goes along with this. I was, uh, about a month ago, uh, Captain Wayne Solvay there in the back, who I served uh, in Afghanistan with uh, when he was a sergeant major, and he's now a fine officer uh, working with you, um, asked me to come to your Pacific Region Spring Concentration. Uh, absolutely something I couldn't turn down, an opportunity that I looked very, very, very forward to, and it was an honor and a privilege for me to go there, and I spoke for a couple hours to your leadership course. Um, and then um, Wayne asked me, uh, you know, would you mind speaking to the entire concentration at the end of the day? Uh, of course, no problem. So I did so, and I was on my way out, and I was just sort of saying goodbye to some of the CIC officers, and they were like, sir, we'll see you in a month, sir. And I was like, see you in a month? Um, so, you know, I'm an infantry officer, I take things a little slow, and so I thought, okay, well, see you in a month. And uh, away I went, and uh, you know, about the fifth person that came along, and they're like, sir, we'll see you in a month. And I thought, geez, what are all the CIC officers doing coming up to Edmonton next month? <laughs> so, and then about two weeks ago, I sat down uh, at, uh, in Vancouver at the St. Julian Dinner. Um, I served with uh, Hard Sajan, the CEO of uh, St. Julian Dinner, and as, of course, I'm coming in as Cost 39, so I got an invitation to come down and, and celebrate uh, that evening. And lo and behold, I was sat beside Russ Lacey. <laughs> and Russ sort of turns over and uh, he looks at me and he says, uh, we, need, we need to talk. Yeah, I'm sure, Russ. No, how, how you been? Good to see you. And uh, he's like, well, the programs are printed. <laughs> the programs are printed? Sir, I need you to come to Pillars 2012 and give us... <laughs> so I, uh, yeah. all that to say, I found out that I was coming here about a week and a half ago, but I couldn't be more delighted. Uh, and uh, I'll be honest with you, as I mentioned, it's great to come home and return to your roots. Uh, and I'm going to speak about returning to your roots quite a bit uh, in the next, but I'll try to keep about uh, 30 minutes. So I, I spoke about Russ. Uh, we actually have a little history. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, he's one of the CIC officers that uh, I, I am very proud to call a, a mentor. And um, I met Russ in 1991. I was here uh, in Vernon at Vernon Army Cadet uh, Summer Training Center. Uh, I was a cadet warrant officer, Mason Stalker of Golf Company. And my best friend at the time, uh, Cadet Warrant Officer uh, Rocky Swanson from Powell River, uh, was with me. We were both in golf company. We were platoon to ICs. We were young. We were motivated. We were enjoying life. It was great. But we had a leadership dilemma. Um, Rocky and I, um, you know, we, we tried everything. Uh, we, all the stuff, we brought out all the books. Uh, we had a cadet we couldn't connect with. We just couldn't connect with this cadet. We had problems. He was providing a very, very, very negative atmosphere for us. Uh, and we thought, we need to do something about this. So we did, as any good staff cadet would do. 
we decided to go to the Staff Cadet Canteen, play foosball, and figure it all out. So, on our, on our way to the Staff Canteen, we ran into Russ. I, you know, saluted, said, hey, how you doing, sir? How's things? Well, he said, oh, we're doing okay. Just okay. Uh, you know, we were kind of just a little apprehensive about telling this story because we couldn't solve it ourselves. I said, ah, oh, sir, we, we got a leadership dilemma. A leadership dilemma? Well, where are you guys going? Well, we're headed to the staff canteen. Well, I'll meet you there in 10 minutes with a six pack of Coke. No problem. So Rocky and I went to the staff canteen. We sat down with Russ and uh, what seemed like for three hours for me. Um, <laughs> We, um, we began to tell Russ about uh, our leadership dilemma. We told him about what we had tried to do, how we were not successful, uh, and uh, Russ patiently listened um, and uh, with a few guiding first principles allowed us to actually um, come to our own solution. And we walked out of that cadet canteen uh, confident, motivated, ready to tackle this problem, uh, and we certainly did so. Uh, about seven years after that, I was on uh, the fields of Wainwright in an exercise and I had unfortunately lost track of Rocky and I pulled up in my armored vehicle general purpose grizzly beside this tank and there I look over and there's Rocky Swanson hopping out of a tank hull. Uh, he was driving it and I was like, Rocky, Mason, you know, and uh, so next thing you know, we found uh, that evening, uh, we found time to open up a ham omelet and uh, we had an IMP together and, uh, and Rocky and I, right away started to reminisce about our time in cadets. And it went back to that discussion, that three hours we spent with Russ in the staff canteen, <laughs> maybe four, and, uh, <laughs> and it, you know, I'm a little embarrassed to say that it took me seven years to sort of come to the epiphany that Russ actually didn't tell us what to do. He didn't give us X, Y, and Z are the solutions to your problem. Russ sat and listened and through some very pointed but delicate shaping comments allowed us to create the intellectual space to solve the problem on our own. And embarrassingly, it took me seven years to figure this out and Rocky and I sort of went, whoa, that was, that's how it happened. I'm glad it did take seven years because this coming back to first principles and how he approached that problem and how he facilitated us to come to our own solutions is something that I have become, it's one of my basic tenets. And, and I thank Russ for that very, very, very much. And uh, you know, I, I bring up Russ very deliberately because um, a lot of my mentors are CIC officers. And, and I didn't, you know, I'm not here to, to, to make your heads any bigger or anything like that, but, but quite honestly, uh, um, CIC officers have formed what I believe I contribute to society and the Canadian forces today. Um, Govan Reddy is here, uh, a friend of mine, Miroslav Novak. Um, there are a whole slew of you sitting in this room that, uh, that made me who I am today. Um, John McDonald was my first CO. Some of you may have known him, a Korean War vet, um, commanding officer of the 2458 Revelstoke Rocky Mountain Rangers Cadet Corps. He's my first CO. Um, and I fondly reflect back on the first principles that John um, had passed on to me when he was the commanding officer. Uh, and it was great sadness last year while I was in Afghanistan, I had discovered that, uh, that John had passed. Um, but certainly he's not with us anymore, but uh, I can assure you his legacy is. Uh, next slide, please. So wh what is success? That's what Pillars 2012 is, is all about. And I think to define success is very important. It's very important to return to our foundation, to the aims of our movement, uh, and it's very important that we understand sort of what we're actually looking for here. You're very, next slide please, you're very familiar with the three aims that are up on the, on the screen right now. Develop youth, the attributes of good leadership, citizenship, promote physical fitness, and stimulate an interest in the three elements of the Canadian Armed Forces. You live, breathe, and eat these three aims every day. Every day, this is exactly what you do. And, <laughs> and that's important. Next slide. I've deliberately decided to put a slide on the principles of war to a crowd of cadet, instructor, cadre, league, sponsor, and committee officers. Principles are everywhere, and for very good reason. Ironically though, we can all get very caught up in our busy lives, in the friction, in the noise of current day living, and we can actually lose touch with these principles every day. Of course, we do so at great expense. 
You may be thinking, how do the principles of war apply to me as a CIC officer, as a league representative, as a sponsoring committee chair? I'm training cadets. I'm not training them for war. Of course you're not. And that is exactly my point. There is a principle here, however, that I thought is very salient and one that I wanted to highlight and I'm going to use throughout the next 20 minutes. Selection and maintenance of the aim. It is the first principle of war and it is what we call in the regular force the master principle. I will come back to this often. And I really believe that my peers and myself sometimes lose track of this principle. It is where I consider I fall short sometimes. So this is why I highlight it. I don't, of course, fall short on this principle intentionally, and of course, nor do you. Perhaps maybe the institution hasn't set us up for success sometimes. Regardless, in the last 20 years, 25 years uh, with my cadet experience, I have found that myself and my fellow officers often fail on this principle. Next slide. So back to first principles. Back to selection and maintenance of the aim. How does this help us define success? What is the ultimate aim of the Army Cadet Program? Well, I believe, just like the principles of war, the three aims of the Army Cadet Movement are ordered very appropriately. I would suggest to you that the first aim, developing the attributes of leadership and citizenship, like the selection and maintenance of the aim in the principles of war, is the foundation aim, the master aim, the primary aim, whatever you want to call it. Next slide. So, how do we define success? This is, of course, what Pillars 2012 is all about. Stimulating an interest in the Canadian Forces, promoting physical fitness, these are, of course, also important aims. But I would suggest to you that they are vehicles to the first aim. And, of course, we have many vehicles. Marksmanship, dress and deportment, drill, para, band, many vehicles to help contribute to the three aims. These things, although very military in nature, serve one purpose, I believe, in Army cadets, and that is not to make every cadet a soldier. They are training vehicles, training methods, training vignettes, whatever you want to call them, to piece and build blocks of leadership and citizenship as our young youth move through the Canadian cadet program. Take marksmanship, for example, the marksmanship principles. Focus, control, organization, patience. Take a look at instructional technique, the ability to speak and move and teach cadets from the known to the unknown. We saw a brilliant speaker this morning, obviously taken this vehicle. Look at dress and deportment, attention to detail, focus, teamwork, care. These vehicles, again, although military in nature, have a bigger aim in the cadet program. A cadet who after six years in the program gets out and becomes a caring community volunteer who contributes to their community, perhaps a teacher, a firefighter, a janitor, a policeman or woman, they are just as successful as the ex-cadet who gets the gold in the Olympics or carries on and becomes an NCO or an officer in Her Majesty's forces. So selection and maintenance of the aim is key. And I would propose that it doesn't matter what you call it, but in my humble opinion, that we, if we are going to define success in Pillars 2012 and in this great program, we must ensure we directly correlate it with the aim. And we must select and maintain the aim. Of course, fitness and stimulating an interest in the Canadian Forces are important. But I would argue that success in the first aim, citizenship and leadership, and perhaps not as much success in the second and third, is a successful program. So what? Put simply, if everything we do in the Army Cadet Program promotes the development of citizenship and leadership, we are successful. The definition of success, I would argue, can then be defined as simple demonstrations of citizenship, simple demonstrations of leadership. While we will certainly have ex-cadets who go on to be great Olympic athletes, politicians, mayors, community leaders, we will also have ex-cadets who get out and contribute small but very valuable, very valuable actions to their communities. And of course, they are equally as successful as that para-athlete that won gold. To me, this is what you define 
success as. Next slide. You've probably heard this before. This is probably the topic of some conversation, perhaps, between you and some of your officers, maybe your sponsoring committees. How do we keep the Army in Army cadets? You hear this. I hear it. And I haven't been around the cadet program for quite a while. Friends, I would suggest to you that the Army and Army cadets has never left. And I would suggest to you that the cadet we are producing today is just as successful as the cadet we produced 20 and 40 and 60 years ago. Yes, we have had instit institutional changes. Yes, we have lost some funding. Yes, we have had some staff reduced. Yes, the STAR program has changed. We've lost the large caliber rifles and we've moved and we've transformed the vehicles to the aims. But the success of this program, our program, is not because of the band program. It is not because of the marksmanship program. It is not because of drill and deportment. The success of this program, conversely, is not because we have gotten rid of certain systems or equipment. The success of this Army Cadet program, which of course has the one aim of developing citizenship and leadership, has very little to do with the institution and has a lot to do with you. And I know this to be true. And you say, you're right out of her. How do you know this? You haven't been in the cadet system for 20 years. You're right, I haven't. But in the last 20 years, I have continued to return to my first principles that Russ, John McDonald, and many of you have instilled in me. Whether it be in routine operations here in Garrison or it be in Kandahar, Afghanistan. Whether it be friends that I have met and reconnected with in cadets. When you find out that someone is a cadet and you're in Kandahar, it is an immediate connection that you have with them because of the skills that you have embodied in them. And it is not measurable. Now I mentioned to you that I had the opportunity about a month ago to speak to your spring concentration and I saw firsthand the product of just plain you. These cadets asked very intelligent questions. They were polite, they were motivated, they were determined. They were spending their spring break in Vernon while all of their peers who were not cadets were back home playing Xbox, on Facebook, just hanging out. So they decided, they made a conscious decision to not do that, but to come to Vernon and reinforce first principles. That is success. And they asked me a question. They said, sir, what are the three things that you took from cadets when you left? I, I kind of caught me off guard. I wasn't really prepared for that, quite honestly. Um, and, uh, but quite honestly, the answer is very simple and very basic. The first thing I told them was that everything they needed to know to be a two-star general, to be a politician, to be a teacher, to be a successful businessman or woman, they would learn in cadets. Just ask Brigadier General Winnick, about to be promoted two-star, won the Sword of Honor in 1978, was here at Vernon Army Cadet Summer Training Center last summer to be the reviewing officer, about to go and be Deputy Commander, Canadian Army. He will tell you, that his cadet career was vital in the foundation of his skill set. I told them that being a general, a politician, it's not rocket science. And that if you return to first principles, if you return to your roots, you will always know what right looks like. Because it's easy when you go back to the basics to say, that looks wrong, that looks right, and follow your heart. The second thing I told them was about a story when I was in Panjoué, Kandahar. It was in July 2006, and we were in the midst of combat operations, and uh, Wayne was close by, in fact. I was in the uh, battalion command post, and we were getting ready to uh, essentially do a deliberate attack uh, on a area of operations where the Taliban had taken some strongholds. Uh, it was hot. I was tired. Everyone was tired. It was dusty. Uh, we hadn't slept for days and we were about to go into a combat operation that I anticipated would last a long time. So I, I was walking out of the command post and I had four of my guys there um, and they were ripping open an IMP and, and getting some rounds down range before we headed down uh, into the attack. I said to myself that this would be an opportunity probably to eat because I may not get a chance to eat in the next sort of 12 or 24 hours so I decided to join them. And I sat down with them about an hour before HR in the middle of Kandahar province 
almost ready for a combat operation, we figured out that three of us five had been in the Army cadets. And then Kandahar disappeared. And we started to reminisce about Vernon and talk about who each other knew. And we figured and we laughed and we got, it was just, we were in a different world at that time. And I'm sure that the two other people that were not in Army cadets certainly wanted to be after they finished <laughs> with our story. <laughs> so I told the cadets last month that uh, the second thing that I took away from cadets was people, friends, connections. And uh, that little example uh, in the middle of Pajway District, Kandahar, I think highlights that perfectly. The last thing I told them uh, that I took from cadets was fun. I had a blast. I'm still having a blast. I'm having a blast doing this. Um, and uh, I commented that they must be too. Because here they were in the middle of Vernon for a week, not on spring break, but rather doing drill and deportment and going to the Vernon Army mess, which Govan has improved. All right. And, uh, <laughs> but they weren't back home with their peers. They were there and they were learning first principles. And they agreed. They were having fun. So three things. Next slide. How do we maintain this success that you have achieved? How do we ensure that this legacy continues? The environment we live in can be chaotic. The challenges that you as officers, NCOs, sponsoring committees, leagues reps, they're painful, they're time consuming, and they're frustrating. The institution is not perfect. The Department of National Defense is about to go through another round of cuts. It will certainly reduce staff. We will see programs cut, procurement cut, and they may affect the wonderful program that we love. But friends, this is all friction and noise. While we as officers must be aware of the strategic context, we must ensure that we do not allow it to lose focus. We must remember selection and maintenance of the aim. The fog of war, friction, noise, drama, whatever you want to call it, is a place where we as leaders can fall short. This little 30 second conversation that ended with a pat on the back renewed my energy, renewed my focus. It reminded me that I can't contribute to the fog of war, I must eliminate it. It reminded me that a little bit of encouragement, just like sitting in the staff canteen in 1991 when Russ Lacey provided me some encouragement, a little encouragement can be a combat multiplier. Next slide. So to sustain the success that you as a team have worked so hard to achieve, we must fight through friction. We must fight through noise. Inaction is our enemy. It is the ally of friction and is the main reason that we are often less successful than we ought to be. When the noise or friction, often in the form of some of the statements on the screen, does not allow us to create that intellectual space to think a problem through clearly, we have failed. Friction has always existed, always. Our forefathers and, and mothers have dealt with it. Perhaps the friction at the time or the noise at the time was in different shapes and sizes, but it was there. I, I, I'm in the process of reading a book right now by Dr. Uh, Doug Delaney. You, some of you may know him. He's a, a Canadian military historian. Uh, he's currently at uh, RMC. He just published a book on five corps commanders in the Second World War. And this book titled Corps Commanders, which you can see the cover of it on the screen, examines how five strikingly dissimilar Canadian and British Canadian, pardon me, Canadian and British Corps generals fought to fit and be successful in the British Empire during Second World War. And while I don't want to simplify Doug's 408 pages, Doug argues that amidst the vast amounts of friction and noise in World War II, most notably the training deficiencies that those five corps found themselves with, and of course we've read many writings on some of these uh, great generals about their own personal deficiencies. Doug argues that what made them successful was their return to first principles, was their selection and maintenance of the aim. But most of all, he argues, it was their projection of their personalities. They fought in action and they didn't clear the fog of war by yelling, but rather how clearly they articulated 
their intent. I argue that friction and noise will always be with us. We heard some friction and noise this morning, and it will likely get worse in some occasions. But we as officers, league reps, sponsoring committee, we as the team that is selecting and maintaining the aim to make good citizens and leaders in this country, we as that team cannot lose focus of first principles. We must constantly remind ourselves of what we're here to do. With this in mind, I believe, then just plain you can see through the fog at the pillars of success. Because everything you need to know to be a two-star general, you will learn in cadets. We heard this morning about some cadets and CIC officers that fought through friction. They fought through noise and they succeeded. Now, it wasn't easy and I don't want to downplay their actions. Of course it was tough. They were challenging. But with first principles in mind, these teams of sponsoring committees, league representatives, they move the yardsticks forward. So my question to you is, how will you ensure this success is sustained? Like the five core commanders in Doug's book, like Russ, like John McDonald, like the many in this room, I think you will learn this and you will make it succeed because of just plain you. Next slide. I was a terrible second lieutenant. And um, it, it wasn't that I didn't work hard. Um, I, at least I thought I did. Uh, I cared for my soldiers. I got in early. I was fit. I worked late. Um, and uh, I did everything that I thought I was supposed to do. But I spent way too much time looking at other second lieutenants and lieutenants and tried to be like them. I thought that the Army had the mold of what an officer must be. It stifled my personality, and most importantly, it stifled my thought process. I made bad decisions, quite honestly, because I tried to emulate what other successful lieutenants were doing, but not what I should do. Bottom line, I was afraid to be different. I was afraid to be me. I was not being myself. A leader's job is to bring out the best in each and every one of us for the betterment of the organization and the mission, selecting and maintaining the aim. I, I, my first company commander, his name was Stu Sharp. And uh, I think he was very good at being himself. He broke the stereotypical mold that most military leaders thought they had to be. He laughed, usually at himself. And he took risks. He was creative. But every day, he patted soldiers on the back and gave words of encouragement. He was a great commander in every sense of the word. But first of all, he was Stu Sharp. That is when I learned that I could be myself and an officer at the same time. And while I could never be Stu Sharp, and nor should I have wanted to be, I could be Mason Stalker. Don't be afraid to be you. It is what has built the success that this program currently has. And it also has built the path ahead that you must sustain. Next slide. So based on the mentorship of people like Russ Lacey, John McDonald, Wayne Sove, Sergeant Arnold, Govan Reddy, Wayne Emdy, Miroslav Novak, Francois Arsenault, Linda Hildebrandt, Lyle Johnston, and many, many more of you in this room, I realized that just plain me could make a difference. Armed with fighting in action, armed with first principles, by selecting and maintaining the aim amongst a vast amount of institutional friction and noise, a difference could be made. Friends, Army Cadets is not broken. The Army is alive and well in Army Cadets. And you are producing great leaders and great citizens. And you are producing them not because you're throwing money at the problem and not because the institution is setting you up for success. And by no means am I downplaying what the institution is doing for you. But you are producing leaders and citizens for one reason, just plain you. Fight in action. Remember first principles and select and maintain your aim. And amidst all the friction and noise that we will encounter in the next bound, never lose focus on the fact that your action 
And conversely, your inaction can be profound. It can be wide and it can be deep. And it can make the difference between success or not. I think this Pillars is absolutely appropriately named. By understanding and defining success, your actions have achieved it. Now the institution will support you, but it will not sustain you. That is up to you. I am so proud to be one of your products. And I'm so proud to be here today. And I hope that the one thing you take away from this last 20 minutes is that it works. And it works because of you. Thank you.